All right, good morning. I'm speaking with Pastor Chris Delmage, and uh, he's actually uh, been at Calvary Assembly. We've uh, enjoyed him speaking to us in the past, and we're desperately trying to get him back to uh, our schedule when we're allowed to have in-person gatherings. <laughs> the good news is uh, we're able to do this right now. Um, so, uh, Pastor Chris, why don't you just tell us a little bit, so uh, where is your church uh, located? Where do you pastor? All right, so I pastor Hempstead Assembly of God. Uh, that's in Hempstead, New York. It's on Long Island, just a couple of minutes outside of the city. And uh, we've been here for about five years, but this is really my, my town. I grew up on Long Island, uh, went to high school on Long Island, and it's always been just a beautiful opportunity just to serve uh, back back here in my hometown. That's great. So uh, how are things out there right now? Like, is are things reasonably calm? Is is the community in a safe place? Or mm. has there been some, some risk uh, inserted in right now? Well, you know, in Hempstead, where we are uh, located, uh, this is probably the place I was hit hardest on Long Island just with the COVID-19. Mm. And so it's been... Um, it's been it's been a state of calm now for the, like the last two weeks, three weeks. Earlier on, when the virus started hitting, um, you know, there was devastation everywhere. And so, with that being said, you know, we thought that was going to be the issue that we had to pray through. Um, yeah. and, but now, in terms of you know the, the uh, social unrest and things like that, nothing in this immediate area. There are other pockets uh, on Long Island where there is activity, some peaceful, some not. But right where we are right now, um, it, it seems to be a, a time of calm and peace. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll pray that remains. Uh, yeah. Rochester has seen uh, some uh, protests that have uh, uh, turned a little bit on the more violent side. And mm -hmm. uh, obviously in, in upstate uh, New York, uh, these are not common things for us to see. I think other cities deal with this more frequently, but. Uh, mm -hmm. It's coming to us, and uh, I'm not sure we have a good paradigm through which to process this, to know how to pray about this. Uh, uh, in my experience, uh, there's not a shortage of voices being raised uh, right now, but not everything that's being said uh, is, is helpful right now. Right, and, uh, right. So before we get into the really weighty stuff, I, I did mm -hmm. want to ask, I, I did want your opinion on a couple things. So uh, the greatest basketball player of all time is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I would have to say Michael Jordan as a lifelong Knicks fan, uh, left at his mercy many a times, uh, yeah, okay. turning off my television in anger. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I've seen it, but uh, with my eyes, uh, witnessing that type of greatness, I would have to say with humility, Michael Jordan. Yeah, I, I happen to agree with you on that. I was, I was terrified you were going to say LeBron James, and, <laughs> and then I would never be able to talk to our staff again on anything related to basketball. But uh, now I, I just watched the docuseries on that, and... Uh, you know, I was actually in, uh, worried about watching it that he would not be as good as I remember him. Right. He was better than I remember yes, him. <laughs> absolutely. I, I felt the same way. I'm yeah. like, I couldn't, I didn't, I totally forgot that game or I totally forgot that was the situation. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I guess, yeah, he is, he is the greatest. I hate to admit it, but <laughs> it is what it is. And then, and then you're out in Long Island. So uh, rumor has it you're a Jets fan. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. So yes, are you looking yes. forward to this season or? Uh, every season I say no, um, uh, <laughs> because it, it brings a sense of pain and, and, and anger, but it's an incredible exercise of faith, trust, grace, and mercy. And so there's a yes and no. I, I love football. Um, my body reacts just when the seasons start changing. But then there's always going to be that moment uh, in the first three weeks where I realize, oh boy, here we go again. And so hopefully now that things have changed a bit in our division, uh, you know, then again, let's, <laughs> it's, let's amazing. it's amazing how much hope can rise when one person leaves. <laughs> so we'll see, you know, maybe this is a reset, but uh, we'll, we'll, listen, I, I, I'm always a big talker the first two weeks and the last week of preseason. 
and then reality sets in around the third week, fourth week. So yeah. hopefully that doesn't happen this year. Yeah, we, we know all about that. At least the Jets have a Super Bowl. You guys have been once and took it, but we knocked on the door four times and then we went home. So <laughs> we don't have much to show. But there's always hope. That's that's why we're here. <sighs> Definitely. So um, listen, um, I think uh, all of us uh, have seen the images that have been um, on every screen that I own right now. And uh, it has been intensely painful to see yeah. and to hear some of the language related to this stuff. And I know in, in my own heart, um, just when I've seen these kinds of images and, and heard the kind of language that I'm hearing, um, I feel like we're missing some stuff, and, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, am I angry? Yes. Am I sad? Yes. But um, what, what was the person feeling who was enduring this? Right. You know, right. Um, I'm a man. Um, men, as a rule, uh, avoid, if at all possible, pleading or begging for anything. Right. And then a person had to go there. And then there had to be a moment when he realized he's not getting out of this. Um, I don't know what that fear and that, um, that resignation feels like at that level, but I'm, I'm concerned that that's not really a, a lot of the conversation that we've been heard. Right. Uh, so, so I'm just kind of curious when you have seen images like that, like what kind of thoughts come to your mind? What kind of feelings are you able to name? You know, what emotions are rising up? Um, I, I think it'd be helpful for us to hear that. Right. Um, no, I think there's something um, uniquely different about um, viewing this one. Um, a couple of reasons is because of the actual length of time of the event, um, the, the sense of helplessness, um, exactly where you know the knee was placed and i've done jujitsu so i know um that move can just just feel agonizing mm -hmm. but um not only that there there are a couple of things that made this situation different i think the pleading of numerous people around was something the the knowledge that uh you they were being recorded um in a sense of you know this is what it is and um <clears throat> And already a charged atmosphere in regards to you know this type of thing, and so um, personally, um, images like this tend to have already created a numbness inside of me, um, a numbness with you know inside of many uh, you know in my community. Now I'm making sure that I'm going to speak for myself and let others who hear this kind of. You know attached to that feeling as well um since uh kindergarten first grade um seeing images of the civil rights movement seeing things like that those are things that are already etched in <clears throat> but in this modern day when you have access to uh recording devices um there's something different about this last one um and to, to hear him crying out and um, I know with me, uh, I've uh, emotionally, it's the first time since maybe Trayvon Martin that um, I know I cried a bit. Um, and, and, uh, and like you said, as a man, I, I, I didn't want my family to see. Um, it was a bit visceral and raw. Uh, it's the first time in a long time that's happened to me. And right when you think you have it under control, you have a conversation with your family at the dinner table and they see dad, dad crying about this. And, 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 and my daughter, my son, uh, I've worked very hard to kind of shelter them from that. Um, my wife and I, we've, we, we, we decided that early on and um, to see this. And even I wanted to prevent my son from seeing it. But then on the other hand, I knew he needed to see it. And, and to see that horror um, and, and for them now to ask questions about it. And so it, it, it really shook me. Um, I, in my, I gotta be honest with you, my first mind, the first thought in my mind didn't even think, I didn't even think about racism per se. T 
to me, it's almost, it almost jumped beyond that so quickly just to hear a human being crying out that way and to see the response, uh, the callous, no remorse, no questioning. Is this okay? Am I doing this right? And to have multiple people in authority to not be able to step in and to feel helpless, not to say something, not to, you know, that's what makes this, this issue a little bit different, weightier. It's nothing new. It's just that it's been recorded. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of individuals are coming to grips with, that it's, it's not new. Um, it's just been recorded. I mean, you don't have to share anything you're not comfortable with, but so how, if you're able to, hmm? how are you able to process some of that conversation at home? Because this is, I mean, I know how volatile it is just around the people that, that uh, I, I generally spend some time with. What, what is that like? <clears throat> I tell you what, um, I value a greater uh, every day the, the, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, my relationship with the Lord Jesus. I cannot imagine how to even get through this, how to process this without the Word of God, without the Holy Spirit, honestly. That's the God honest truth. Um, uh, I, I stand on that because uh, anything else probably um, would, would result in violence. Yeah. Um, that's the truth. Um, uh, it's so deep and raw. Uh, to, I wouldn't be able to have a conversation about it without the Spirit of God. So if there's ever been a time that I, I believe in the uh, existence and um, the existence of the power of God, the saving grace of the power of God. It's, it's in a situation like this where I could sit down with my son and daughter and talk to them about it. Um, they know my history. They know where I've come from, where God has saved me from. And for me to sit down and talk to them about love, about peace, about being the salt of the earth, about being the light of the world, um, it creates, um, it makes a lot of sense that even through this suffering, um, God has called us to be the light in the darkness of a sin-soaked world, mm -hmm. and, and that matters. And so I've been very honest, been very authentic with them. Uh, I don't cry in front of my family, <laughs> well, up until now. Um, uh, and, and, and for them to see those tears and then see how dad processes it and walks through it with the word of God and brings them along, I think <clears throat> has been a great lesson for them, for my church and for my community. Yeah. Well, there, there's not been a shortage of voices being raised right now. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anything or, or heard any language that you think is actually helping the situation? Uh, I know there's a lot that may not be, but have you heard mm -hmm. anything that sounds like it, that makes sense or it's, it's, it's helping us see this in a, in a way that helps us move forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, when, when someone who doesn't quite understand what it feels like mm -hmm. says, I don't understand, but because you're hurting, I'm hurting, that does, that does just wonders. Um, the Bible says a love covers a multitude of sins. And I think um, to say something when you're not ready to say something is a mistake. <laughs> you know, we should be uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Uh, and so I don't want to rush anyone to say something when they don't know what to say, they don't know how to say it, or they're not even done processing what to say. What is safe for someone to say is, I wish, uh, not even I wish, I don't understand. Yeah. Instead of coming across like they do understand and willing to begin to uh, make uh, statements and suggestions. Um, and so the fact that we have individuals in my life that may not know what it's like, may not even, they weren't even aware that that was an, a current issue or an ongoing issue in my life. And people who are like me simply say, I love you because of the relationship we have. I don't understand what's going on. If there's anything I can do to help, I want to. And, and because you're mourning, I am mourning. That, that is just such a powerful thing. I, I, know, I know the enemy hates that. The enemy would rather us remain divided because of not having experiences. But when we're able to say, I love you, um, and I don't understand, but because you're hurting, I'm hurting too, that 
that that's that's just amazing yeah so you serve as a a, a spiritual shepherd of a, a community of faith um you're going to stand in the pulpit on sunday uh, you know what they've seen you know what they've heard uh, you had probably some conversations with a number of them um, what kind of conversation are you able and willing to have uh, from the front of the room uh, to help a church family process something like this? Good. Um, I wouldn't say, <clears throat> especially within our fellowship, when I was raised in, in church, um, there was a difficulty in understanding that justice is a part of being a child of God. Um, and so sharing and explaining through the word, biblically speaking, why justice is a part of who God is. He's a just God. And, and, and just going through certain scriptures that's there, that's always been there, that shows how it's uh, a responsibility of, of, of the believers, those who love God, to ensure that justice occurs on this earth. That's one thing, because uh, a lot of the frustration comes from an idea that there is no other way um, that there is no hope or um, hope re re you know, rests in me taking it for myself. And um, as, as believers, as a, as a pastor speaking to um, you know, the congregation and even in the community, um, letting them know that it's okay to not be okay right now, letting them know that it's okay to speak out for justice, knowing that in, in this great country, uh, the 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 beautiful thing about uh, this country is its ability to change. It's the 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 incredible high ideals of the founders. Uh, you know, ideals that every man is created equal, and and that is such a high ideal. Where at the time it almost seemed that was an uh, that was an impossibility. But we are able to move together uh, towards that, and it requires even as believers to be advocates of justice. Um, and to do it in the right spirit. You know, I, listen, my greatest challenge right now is, is with other brothers who are believers and, you know, some from, you know, different congregations, different, and they, they want action. And, and they, you know, some feel that they deserve the right to create damage and harm. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, that's totally understandable. Uh, you know, James and John wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. And, 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 and they felt that they had the right to do it. But then we have to be reminded uh, what Jesus said. He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. This is not what we're about. And that could be probably a difficult pill. I know it was for me that, you know, uh, growing up, my dad was a just, he's just an incredible man of God. And he, he raised me, turned the other cheek and all that stuff. Listen, I was the guy that said, no, uh, that's not going to happen to me. Uh, we're not going to turn no other cheek. And so I know by the time in my late teens, you know, I, 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 very, I drifted away from Christ and really began to embrace black nationalism, um, Nation of Islam, really held dear the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, uh, Malcolm X, things that really I felt I needed to empower myself uh, uh, to be a black man. And then... To, to, to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and come to him, the hardest part was um, to not feel the ability to, you know, quote unquote, stand up for myself or, you know, by any means necessary, I will get respect. And, and, and Jesus challenges us with the word, you know, you know this is his way. And, and you, I could feel how Peter felt when he had to leave, drop that sword in the garden. He says, we're not going to kill nobody. And, and it's like, no. And it's like, now you're in this place of vulnerability. As a pastor, that is the greatest, um, I would say, in terms of speaking to spirit-filled believers that, um, you know, the wrath of man will not produce the righteousness of God. Yeah. And, 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 and for me to say that in this season, some would say, come on, pastor, this is not the time. But the truth is, it is the time. It is the time that uh, we continue to be salt, that we continue to be light. And, and that is what, you know, being able to run into the, you know, the name of the Lord, which is a strong tower and leaning on him and, and, and asking for his presence and his peace in this time. That's been my message while at the same time saying it's okay to speak out about injustice. It's okay to move forward so that all 
are, are, are equal. Like that is something that's important. And, and is it, is it, is it tricky? Uh, yes. Does it require wisdom? Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, uh, pastor, um, uh, I've been leaning on the Lord so much in the last three months from trying to navigate a uh, global pandemic into this. It's been like, wow, God, uh, just speak. And you know what? He's never let me down yet. He has not let me down. His, his word is clear. His, um, his guidance is sure. And, and so I'm confident that the more we trust in the Lord and the more we just lean on him, you know, he, he will direct our paths in the way that we are to go. Yeah, that's, that's super helpful. You mentioned, uh, you know, being slow to speak. Uh, probably the last thing anyone wants is the first thing that comes to my mind. <laughs> I may have to get to a second or third thought before it's worth sharing. Um, but on that issue of sharing, like, I'm, I'm hearing lots of voices raised, and I don't doubt that their intent is to try to help. But I'm not sure that, that it always works out that way. Like, what, what are some things that, that I can do to help people who are hurting and who are afraid and who are angry? Because all of those things are true. And, and I, I have a voice. I want to use it as wisely as possible. So how can I help people who are struggling with those, those emotions right now? Excellent. I think what we're doing right now um, uh, has been a certain amount of I want to say responsibility on, on the part of us as leaders to build relationships, um, to lead the way in what we would perceive as change, even though we're not aware of the full extent of uh, each other experiences. Um, the fact that we have a friendship, the fact that we can lean on each other for insight and understanding is a part of the process. Um, you may not really understand the depths and the nooks and the crannies of, of how I have had to deal with this. However, your friendship with me has brought me into a place where I feel comfortable that I can speak to Bob about this. Let me be clear. I can't speak to everybody about this. Let, let me be clear with that. Let me be clear. Um, um, this, this is not a dog and pony show. This is not for, when I share, I'm sharing with individuals whom I, throughout the process of time, have gotten to know, have gotten to love, have gotten to trust. And I feel comfortable that when I speak to them, they're not gonna try to manipulate, they're not gonna try to disrespect. And I cannot say that about everyone. And so what you've already done, you've already established um, uh, an atmosphere, an environment where um, that, that, that love for each other has created opportunity so that people who may be hurting on both sides, you, you understand? Like there are people that I have dear to me who, who are not black, right? Some who are in law enforcement. I know they're in law enforcement and I don't know what it's like to go out on, on, you know, and, and, and do what they do. I don't know what it's like to have fear around every corner. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to be black. I know what it's like to, to be searched. I know what it's like to be frisked. I know, and I can speak to that, but then they can also speak to me about what they're dealing with and so forth. And if we have the spirit of God together, we can now begin to create an environment where we can begin to understand each other. And his hurt, listen, his hurt is my hurt. I have a, a friend of mine, he's a sergeant in the Yonkers Police Department, and I sent him a text, and I said, I love you, man, and mm -hmm. I, I, you guys mean so much to me in my life, and I need you to be safe. I cannot, I don't know what I'm going to do if I find out that you are hurt in the midst of this. One of our young uh, youth uh, graduated, and he's now serving as Metro Police in D.C., He's one of our youth, but he's serving because he had a heart to protect and serve my heart. I said, listen, I need you to be safe in the midst of this craziness. And, and so uh, what we can do together is continue to create that environment of love and trust, even though we might not understand everything, so that when the time does come, we can just sit down at the, at the table of brotherhood and begin to speak uh, love into each other, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, 
just to hear you say that um, helps me understand. It, it, there's a lot of assumptions built in. This is my challenge right now. Everybody's mm -hmm. telling us you have to choose a side. Right. And, and the truth is, is that we want reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And if all I do is throw stones at someone, they're never going to be healed. Right. They're never going to be transformed. And, and so that, that kind of leads me to this, this next question, which is the church really is supposed to be, and I think is different from every other organization in the world. Like we're not just a political organization or just a social organization, or you know, there's something different about who we are. Yeah. So how do we, how do we come with that difference to a situation like this? What resources do we have that maybe other organizations don't? Right, right. And let me tell you, um, we have the word of God, which yeah. honestly, it sounds so simple. And, and some would even say corny, but I will lean on that corniness today because yeah. it, is, it is making me, it, it's bringing me through this crisis. I came across this passive scripture um, in, in, in Proverbs, right? And it was like, you no, know, six things that God hates, seven that God like loathes yeah. and detests, yeah. right? And it's like, he hates... Um, uh, the lying tongue and and uh, uh, sh uh, hands that shed innocent blood and and a heart to devise wickedness and all this, and he gets to the last one and he says and one who spreads strife among the brothers, yeah. and to hear that um, that word strife it actually means to to create an environment where there's going to be shouting and arguments, like that like and to hear that God finds that disgusting. To, to hear that God finds that deplorable. Like if he, he used the word hate and it was that last one that made him go, wait, no, no, wait, no, not just hate. I think it's an abomination when we uh, create that. And so because I consider anyone in the body of Christ, my brother or sister, um, there has to be a balance. There needs to be a, a, an approach in which I can share my heart. Even if it's raw, I need to be mindful that I don't want to create strife in the midst of my brethren. Um, we've gotten used to that. I think uh, ever since um, the OJ Simpson trial and the advent of the 24 hour news cycle, yeah. then we throw in the, the, the emergence of social media and things of that nature, the ability for people to voice their opinions, the ability for people just to just, just get things off their chest is becoming a part of the norm. It's become a part of normal. I remember when the news came on at six o'clock and seven o'clock, <laughs> but and, but but now news is also about having people argue and and force you, pigeonhole you, into a grid of belief, and that I believe has become dangerous because as believers we know that life and death is in the power of the tongue. We recognize the importance of words, how things are said, when they're said, what is being said. And, um, you know, I take that very seriously. So even though I have raw feelings, I hold true to uh, listen more than I speak. I, I, I hold to the truth that the anger that I have, the rage that's here, you know, the Lord is telling me, Chris, uh, be very slow with that because whatever comes out and if it's of you, it will not produce the righteousness that God is expecting. I hold that very close to me. And sometimes I get criticized for it. That's okay. Listen, I'm sure there may, there may have been other disciples that wanted to burn up Samaria too besides James or John, uh, but Jesus is not having that. Uh, my words matter. Your words matter. Um, and so we're very quick to, to, to hold back on that and, and hear from the Lord. And so... Um, as much as these feelings are real, I'm very slow to call someone a racist because that's very hard to walk back from. Um, I think that's, that's a term. I don't believe, I believe racism exists and I believe that racists exist. However, I want to make sure that my, my, my embracing of my communication process, the integrity, the credibility of it is intact so that when I speak, people will want to be a part of that process of, of hearing and understanding. And so if I'm just uh, uh, reckless with my words because of charged emotions, I can uh, really impact that process of communication. 
Um, the, the, the body of Christ has a platform. I'll be honest with you, Bob, in times past, there was incredible amounts of silence. Yes. And it wasn't from a lack of power. It easily could have been from a lack of understanding, sure, but probably a lot from just being uncomfortable, uh, maybe not willing at that moment to say anything. I will say that this, uh, this is different. This feels different. Um, you know, some people don't want me to say that, but I think I would be failing as a, 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 a pastor, as a, as, a, as, a, as a member of the body of Christ, not to say, you know, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I see something happening that did not happen three years ago, did not happen five years ago, did not happen 10 years ago. Uh, the fact that uh, people that I respect and I love who are not black are bothered. And it's not uh, an internal bothering. It's, it's a reaching out and saying, I don't know what to do with this feeling. I don't know the specifics, but what I do know is what I saw can't be right. And that's beautiful because three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that we can speak about it and, and, and love each other with respect, you know, I see that as God beginning to finally, uh, not even God, we finally getting to a point where Lord do what you have to do and, and so that we can move forward as, mm. as, as a community. Yeah, that's super helpful. Um, obviously with, with the, the reality of social media, we all have a platform and a voice now. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there any advice you would have for those of us who, who our emotions are running high? Like yeah. uh, I may appear to be relatively calm today. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, uh, internally, you know, I am, I am broken by this, and I am furious about this, and I don't know what to do about this. Right. And I do think that words matter. So, what advice would you have, like, when we log on to all of the social media options that we have, mm -hmm. uh, how can we use that in a way that actually furthers the, the purposes of God? Yeah, I, I would. We know life and death is in the power of the tongue, and there are certain. Uh, vehicles, mediums that will um, really assist and help in communication. Texting and, and tweeting and posting, believe it or not, is not one of those. It's, yeah. it's just not. Uh, there is no sense of tone, inflection. There's no uh, facial expressions. You can't tell sarcasm from just pure hatred. And, and just, not only that, uh, people tend to have a lot more coverage saying things when they're not looking at you in your eye. Um, and so I don't, I don't really engage in trolls online. I don't even engage in having debates and things like that. I believe in having conversations. I believe in conversing. I believe that when we're done speaking, I, walk, I, just, I walked away with knowledge I did not have before. I was able to share it with you. And so I, I value face-to-face uh, -face conversations. Yeah. I value uh, phone conversations. Um, uh, when it comes to that, um, I want to make sure that every word that comes out of my mouth, uh, that my Lord says, that's good. You know, um, uh, the Bible says, um, what he said, he says, uh, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify uh, the Father which is in heaven. And that word works, Aragon, right? No, it, it sounds like energy or whatever, but it really means to um, uh, have good business, to have good business sense, to uh, be a, a, a good entrepreneur. In other words, let your light shine so that men can see that you're good for business and give glory to God uh, who's in heaven. Like what, when I put something on Facebook, if I put something on Twitter, am I good for God's business? That's basically what it means. Yeah. Uh, and the light is... My, the light that Christ places in us is shining so that people who may not necessarily know God or want God can look at our behavior, can see what we say and how we say it and when we say it. And they're like, wow, you know, you know, wow. They will shine the light on our heavenly father because that's the only way it can happen. That's key, you know? And so um, how I utilize my words whether I'm in the pulpit, whether I'm just hanging out at the ballpark, whether I'm on Facebook, I want to make sure that I'm always aware and I give the Holy Spirit uh, um, room. I give him permission to shut me down 
if yeah. I'm going to be bad for, for my father's business. And, and if that's something we can do as believers, uh, because the world is going to say what they want to say. And my, my, biggest, my biggest concern is that as believers, whether, you know, because we're not handling things properly, we just put bullets in the enemy's gun. We give him the ammo. Yes. And then yes. he'll take this to that next level. And yes. we didn't, we weren't aware. And I'm talking about both sides. You know, if, if I'm constantly making moves like this and I'm not, I'm not embracing the, the presence and the, and the power of God in all of that, the enemy will use that to, to now promote something else. Yes. And we, it, it, it happens. And so I'm very aware. I want to be good for business for my dad. You know, I want to be yeah. good for dad's business. That's important to me. That's really wise. Thank you. That, that's, that's super helpful for me. Um, th there's this passage in uh, uh, 2 Kings 6 where uh, an enemy army has surrounded the house of the prophet Elisha mm -hmm. and uh, their intent is to abduct him and uh, 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 the servant in the house uh, becomes very frustrated and fearful and he goes to the prophet and you know he wants to make sure the prophet understands the gravity of the situation and elisha says that there are more that are for us than those who are with them or who are against us mm -hmm. and the servant can't see it right and the prophet prays that his eyes would be open right. and this passage fascinates me it convicts me honestly that those of us who live in the house of God, we serve the house of God, we spend time in the house of God. There are things we are blind to, we're not right. seeing them and our eyes need to be open. And if they are open, it'll actually increase our confidence, not just you know, a, a, a bunch of facts that we, we feel um, superior about, but we actually have more confidence. What do you think God would like to open our eyes to see right now that might increase our confidence in, in the season that we're in, that he's at work. Great. You know what? I think the greatest eye opening experience is the fact that um, a system exists that will elevate others and suppress others. That is something that needs to be understood. You know, um, um, growing up, I was a part of a, a gifted program um, in the first and second grade. Um, I had to learn history. And before I even learned the American history that's taught in classrooms, and I had to learn Black history first, Indigenous history first. And so when, um, you know, when we hear, you know, the Declaration of Independence and the founding forefathers and, and all that wonderful stuff, um, I understood from a very early age that that stuff did not come for free. There had to be those who were conquered and so forth and so on, those who had to uh, work in a way that was without their permission and, and slavery. And, and, and even then, how systematic things are different. Um, if I could be honest with you, I actually started to embrace <clears throat> the idea that justice was in the Bible maybe four years ago, you understand? Mm -hmm. Prior to that, what fueled my anger, what fueled my rage was the, the false idea that God was not interested mm -hmm. in my struggle or my rage. My, I, it never came in all these years from theology and Bible college and all that, it never came up that God is interested and is for justice that 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 yes. the the greatest possibility of making this country just incredible like to 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 stand as a beacon of hope for the entire world is that these i these far-fetched ideals that everyone is created equal with unalienable rights yes. in this new world it, they weren't even able to achieve it back then because of the limitations of their mind and their understanding that while they utter these words, someone like me was only three fifths of a man, right? But the ideal, their ideals were there. And, and, and so I would struggle, you know, where I'm coming from, say, how can you say that this is Christian where I'm not a man? However, here we are in 2020 with an opportunity to say, look what our goal is 
and look where we can go. But it requires to see that. I think some of the most difficult conversations I've had in the past was explaining to somebody, you know, why certain neighborhoods look the way they do. Um, why, you know, there is, um, you know, a, a crime in certain areas and not in certain areas. And, and, and so I had asked this one person, this is about three years ago, just, just having a conversation. I love to have these conversations. I said, well, do these things just happen by themselves? And, 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 and he said, well, no, there's gotta be a cause and a purpose to it. And I said, well, I'm not, I'm not that bright, but I can come down to maybe two ideas here. Either there's something going on within the environment and that creates this, or people like me are just born wicked and violent and angry and upset. <laughs> and he didn't appreciate those only two options. And I said, hey, feel free <laughs> to throw another one in there. But it's, it's just a reality that um, if I'm struggling um, to just ask why. I am, I'm a fortunate, I'm fortunate because when I, when I, when I, when I tested high um, as a child in terms of an IQ, I was sent to a specialized program that was in another part of the city. So I wasn't, I, I didn't go to the school based on my district because I just tested out of it. It was too simple for me. And so I had to re be removed and sent somewhere else to do that because of that. From that point on, my parents worked extra hard to constantly put me in private schools and things of that nature, where many of the times I was the only black kid in the class, yes. you, you see. And so these opportunities that were not available where we lived, they had to work twice as hard. They had to go twice as far. I mean, I had to go to school all the way, you know, in Staten Island. I lived in Brooklyn. And, and this, is, this was constant throughout my life. I recognize that the insight I might have, the ability to, to even engage in conversations, my willingness to be the only black guy started you know, way back when, but it required a change where I was. It required to, pull, to be pulled out of that particular place and, and, and gain some of the resources and the opportunities in another place. It exists. And so if I can open my eyes and say, wow, this is what they're going through. Thank you for showing me that. That's important. While on the same token, like I said, I have friends in law enforcement. I have a brother who attends our church. He's a court officer and he is outspoken as it comes. But you know what? He understands what goes through when you guys get in that vehicle and you're out there. He has friends in law enforcement. Lord, open my eyes so that I can see. Yes. What's going on there? What, what's happening here? I open my eyes to see what the, the homeowner uh, uh, is worried about in terms of decreasing property value. Open my eyes to, to see what's happening when this person has to decide between food or just survival. And so that's why they have to do that second or third gig that may not necessarily be legal just so that they can make ends meet. Open my eyes. And what I'm realizing is that when, we, when the Lord opens our eyes, it's no longer a this or that anymore. It's no longer snapped into this or that. You're no longer just liberal or conservative. Or you, it's all of a sudden, you're, you're human beings who lean on the Lord for grace and mercy and understanding. And I think that's something, uh, in terms of God opening our eyes, the value of that, you know? Yeah, no, that's super helpful. I, I think the, the church is not called to... to to decide which side of a line that they're on, but to be a, a voice that actually has something different to say. Yeah. It actually brings light to situations. I, I know a lot of us would like to only focus on one thing or a couple of things, or maybe close our eyes to everything right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that temptation, but we won't find healing and hope from closing our eyes or just right. yelling even louder. Right. And I think that conversations like this have been super helpful for me. I'm, I'm super grateful that you were willing to, uh, to take this time. And uh, uh, notwithstanding the, the Jets uh, loyalty, <laughs> 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 we have a lot in common. Um, I've, I've been in, in your, uh, the, the church that you pastor. And I was there for a, a sectional event and uh, loved the worship. And there was food afterwards, and I loved the food. And uh, um, 
I felt at home and it wasn't because everybody looked the same. There was something else going on. And that's what I'm praying for all of our churches right now, and, you know, where everyone feels so dislocated. Wouldn't it be great right. if we had a place where we felt at home, we, we felt seen, we felt yeah. heard. So. I, I, do re I do recognize that it does require um, courage and boldness uh, for that to happen. You know, um, for me, once upon a time, prior to my, you know, just coming to the Lord as Savior in 1995, you know, if you were to ask me, how do I feel? I would say, I hate white people. That's normal. My brother, he was attending Zion at the time, and he had that conversation yeah. with me, which is probably one of the reasons why he turned up the heat on his prayer, because he realized this was not... And um, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I wish I can say that that just disappeared, but it didn't because I had to go to Zion. I went to Zion Bible Institute. I went to North Point and it's not like there was brothers all over the place. And here I am in the midst of this and I gave my heart to the Lord, but now I'm aware that this, this thing inside me um, does not please him and I had to work it out. Um, it, it requires courage. It, it requires a boldness to um, really confess to the Lord that there are certain things inside of us that really don't meet his standards. And I know a lot of times we talk about all the big home run sins, but me actually having hate in my heart for a particular race based on things that have happened to me in the past, it just was not of, it wasn't of God. And I had to, I had to confront that. I had to deal with that. The Lord helped me deal with it. We went through this incredible process. And every time I thought I got over it, something would happen, right? Something would happen. I go, you know what, God? And, and I'll never forget um, one of my close friends. His father was an evangelist. And um, Tiff Shuttlesworth asked me, because he was very close to my dad, he said, Chris, do you mind uh, showing uh, uh, one, one of my friend's sons around? He's, he, he's considering coming here. And, 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 and I have just great respect for, for, for him. And so I said, you know, sure, sir, sure. And when I heard his father speak, his father had a typical Southern drawl that invoked just goosebumps. And he was like, where is the dorms? Are oh, the dorms? And I'm like, what? And it just every possible caricature of that guy was in my brain. And when I saw him, I'm like, oh, God. No. And I met his son. We ended up becoming the best of friends. I'm his daughter's godfather. Like, and we've had some conversation. I love him. And here's the kicker, Bob. It took courage, right, for me to, to even step into this without knowing who this man was, not, not knowing who the family was. And we became so close. I'll never forget, he invited me and my friends to his house for a weekend. This man has five daughters <laughs> in a big old house. It was me, my friend who was black, and my other friend who's Puerto Rican. And because we are children of God, because we're friends with his son, there was um, a freedom for him to bring us into his home, yes. treat us like his sons. I cannot tell you how revolutionary that was mm. for my brain and for my heart because he would be that perfect example of someone that I will not get along with. And I remember sitting down with my friend. I said, you know, your, your dad allowed us to stay in the same house with his five daughters. And not one time did I feel uncomfortable because I have spidey sense. I can feel uncomfortable. I can, I can feel racism <laughs> from like a mile away. Yeah. My, I, my spidey sense didn't go off once. We yeah. sat down, we had food, we laughed, we played games, we watched TV, we went to the amusement park. His daughters were all over loving up on them because we were family. I, I left that weekend believing in a God that's able to supernaturally transform the hearts of men and women towards him to look exactly like the creation that he created not colorblind 
not colorblind. We see each other's color. We embrace each other's culture. We love each other. We're learning from each other. Yes. And I believe that it's the cross that, that allows that to happen. The tomb is empty as proof that it can happen and it does happen. And, and it, but it does take courage because I could have easily said no. I could have easily stayed in my own place of fear and anger and resentment. And I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about the theological, you know, emphasis in terms of salvation. What I will say is I missed out on an opportunity for the supernatural power of God to change something drastically in my life. Yeah. And I believe that if that didn't happen then, this wouldn't be happening now, you know, and, 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 and I give God thanks for that. And so one of my, encur my encouraging words is uh, don't be afraid to challenge even those fears inside of us. Allow the Lord to lead you out, even, even though you're saved, you know, you gave, there might be some things that's still here, some fear, some anxiety, some anger, some issues. I want you to know that God can lead you out of that and just transform your life to the point, you know, 20 years later, someone, I, I would give that testimony. Someone said, but you, you hated white people? And I, <laughs> I go, yes, yes, really, with all my heart, you know. <laughs> they went, wow, but how? And I go, but that shows you how powerful. Yes, yes how powerful the cross is. The, yes. the, the blood is just, it will never lose its power mm. and it's ongoing. So does that mean I don't feel anger? Does that mean I don't feel rage? No, of course I do. When I see things, when I see injustice, I'm one, but then I have, I have, a, I have a, a, a rock that's higher than I. I have a hiding place that I can run to and say, Lord, I'm not changing my mind, but this is hard right now. Mm. I need you to lead me. Even though this is the value of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're with me. You're riding mm. your staff comfort, you know? And, and, and I could always find presence in and I don't have to lie about it. I can be honest about it and tell you and share that with you. And so that's the greatest blessing of all. Amen. Amen. Well, this conversation has been life to me. Great. And I, it has been so helpful to hear a voice other than just is on every channel and on every blog post right now. And uh, I'm asking God to magnify your voice. This is the stuff we need to hear uh, right now. Um, this is the insight that helps us see things in a different way. And if we can see it differently, then we can say different things. And I think that's absolutely essential right now. So thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure, we, brother. we pray God's blessing on, on you, on your family, and, and on, on your church. I know you've got, uh, uh, you've had a number of funerals related to COVID in the yeah. church. I know you've got one coming up for your uh, brother, My brother uh, on this Friday. Friday. Yep. And uh, I'm praying that God gives you extra grace and strength Thank just you. to serve uh, your family really well in that moment and, uh, and that you'll, you'll recover well from it. Those are, those are weight-bearing exercises. That's yes, hard. Yes, definitely. That's hard. Definitely. All right. So thank you so much, Pastor Chris. My pleasure, brother. I love you. Thank you love for you having too. me. God bless. God bless. Good to see you.